tell you how amazing you look? Do you know how unusual this grouping is? I have been in the field of business ethics for 29 years. And I have never seen anything like what you have here in Oklahoma. So a lot of us think that leadership comes from New York or California or Washington, D.C. When it comes to business ethics, you're it. You're it. Yeah, absolutely. Bill, yeah, you're it. I love this quote from Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of individuals can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So in terms of lifting the business world, in terms of in organizations, in terms of ethics, right now, you're that small group of committed individuals. I encourage you to bring others and continue the revolution that you're starting right here in Oklahoma City. So today, Bill and I are thrilled to be here. I'm here from Utah. Bill's here from Pennsylvania. We're thrilled to talk a little bit about the work that we've done the last couple of years. Um, on uh, identifying the types of ethical dilemmas that people face and trying to give guidance on how do you deal with these difficult situations. So I want to leave you with a few things today. I'm not sure where to point this. There, I got it right. So we're going to be talking about uh, the book that came out of that work called The Business Ethics Field Guide. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's a field guide. Today I'm going to talk and then I'm going to give uh, the majority of the time to Bill O'Rourke to, to illustrate a lot of the uh, dilemmas that we've uh, identified in this book and talk about how we can address those dilemmas. Um, I've got three takeaways for you today though. Three things I want you to remember. Number one, ethical issues are highly predictable. Now oftentimes we think, no, no, I can't predict what, I mean there's so many crazy things that happen and you're absolutely right. So I teach executive MBAs. I've been teaching executive MBAs now for 18 years, first at the University of Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and in Prague, in the, U in, uh, the uh, Czech Republic, now in Utah. I've heard not uh, everything, but pretty close. Because my students all have to come and tell me some ethical dilemma they have faced in their career. And these are all advanced uh, folks in their careers. When it comes to the details of those ethical dilemmas, who knows? I mean, I could regale you for hours with crazy stories. But when it comes to the fundamental issue that they're facing, these issues are highly predictable. I can tell you you're going to deal with these issues. And there's only a, a, a certain set of these issues. And we're going to talk about how many there are. Believe it or not, no one's chronicled before. We have actually chronicled it. Second, because these issues are highly predictable, you can prepare yourself for them, right? If ethical issues were not at all predictable, you couldn't possibly do anything to prepare yourself. But because they are predictable, you actually can develop the skills to handle these things well. And then the third thing that draws from that, or flows directly from that, is if they are predictable, and if you can, develop yourself so you can deal with these better, you can increase your human capital, i.e. the value you provide to others. And the beautiful thing about that is people pay for that value. So you can become more valuable in your organizations as an ethical leader if you understand the kinds of things you're going to face if you prepare yourself to do, that, to do so. So you can't talk about ethics without having a little bit of fun. I'm not sure what board this is. Could be Wells Fargo. Um, Ms. Johnson will now put on the moral blinders. Um, here we got a couple of guys in jail saying, I don't understand. All along, I thought our level of corruption fell well within community standards. <laughs> and then finally, here's an introduction. Hi, this is, our, this is Wiley Watson. He's our controller and vice president of balance sheet special effects. We won't talk about who that might be. So there are two aspects to ethics. Number one, ethics is about, as was stated, about how we treat other people. When it, when it comes right down to the fundamentals of ethics is how we treat other people. So a lot of what we talk about in ethics is caring about other people. We try to be inspirational. And we try to help people understand it's important. You know, being good to other people is important. And it is. And it's absolutely 
necessary for good ethical behavior. Because if you don't have that, the rest of the, what we talk about doesn't matter. However, it's necessary but not sufficient. The other piece is there is a skill set to ethics. And so if you really want to be a strong ethical agent and ethical leader, you have to have both, in a sense, the right heart and the skill set. Today we're primarily going to talk about the skill set. So what are some of these skills? Well, number one, the ability to recognize issues. Oftentimes we see people don't even recognize the ethical issues they're faced with. The ability to recognize the type of ethical issue you're dealing with. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. The ability to make strong arguments based in logic and in history to be influential on other people. So if you're in a situation, if you were in the boardroom with John Stump in Wells Fargo 10 years ago and he was suggesting the plan that they came up with that ended up making, making it where he had to retire in disgrace, they lost, well, Wells Fargo, do we have anybody from Wells Fargo in here? <laughs> there we are, okay. So you know all about this story. Yeah, did you watch me on CNBC? No, it's okay. I got to say some things about John Stump on CNBC. Um, it's a great company, but they made some really big mistakes. So what would you have said to John Stump 10 years ago in that boardroom had you been there? Now, I don't have time to, to go through that exercise this morning, but I, I've got several things I would have taught him from the research, what we know about how organizations work, the kinds of incentive systems, what that does to people. And if you were in that room, think, could I have given him those, those arguments? I could have told him, hey, by the way, Bausch and Loam tried this about 20 years ago. The CEO ended up having to, to resign in disgrace. So you know, maybe you don't want to do it quite this way. Can you make those arguments? Can you use history and logic to persuade others? Um, also, do you know how to create an ethical culture? We could spend an hour on that. We won't do that. But these are kinds of skills that you can develop that uh, make you a more valuable leader. So um, I think these are the ones I just talked about. So today we're going to talk about a field guide. We, we decided to use the notion of a field guide because when you go out into the wilderness, when you go into the mountains, and I live right next to the mountains, when you go into the mountains or you go out any place to discover, it's beautiful. There are wonderful vistas. It's exciting. And so uh, just some pictures here. Here's some, uh, that's close to my house. That's my daughter and son-in-law. Um, this is the view that uh, is from the mountain. This is looking down in my valley. My house is right about there. Brigham Young University is right about there. These are Iguazu Falls. Iguazu Falls come where Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay come together. The first time uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, saw the Iguazu Falls, she said, ooh, poor Niagara. They are beautiful. Uh, there I am on my 50th birthday. It's exciting. I climbed Mount Timpanogos. But there are dangers in the mountains. There are dangers when you go on the wilderness. There are bears. There are snakes. You can get altitude sickness. You can hurt an ankle. So you've got to prepare yourself. You need a field guide to prepare yourself before it. And sometimes you're not, you're not exactly sure what you're going to be faced, so you take your field guide with you. So when you twist your ankle, you get bit by a snake. It's like, oh, what do I do now? So that's what we set out to create, sort of a field guide that you could have in business, and when you face these issues, ah, grab a field guide, what should I do? Oh. Um, so some of those dangers. This is a picture I took of a great white when um, I was, I was uh, cage diving the great whites in South Africa, and you know, I had my 17-year-old son with me, and as we were driving back to Cape Town from uh, this experience, he said to me, darn it, I should have pet petted the, um, the great white. At one point, we had three of them circling our cage. He said, I didn't do it. And the reason he didn't do it is because at the beginning of the day, they said, if you ever have an appendage outside that cage, arm, leg, whatever, you're out for the day. We don't want our, our customers losing appendages. But he said, I was the last one in the cage for the last 45 minutes. What would they have done if I had pet the shark at the end of the day? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't. But three days later, we're at Kruger National Park. 
Or Kruger National Park. Kruger National Park, you go drive around, just like a Yellowstone, you drive around, you look for two things. Number one, you look for animals, and number two, you look for parked cars. And why do you look for parked cars? Because they found the animals, <laughs> right? So we're driving on, on this road, and I see parked cars, and so I kind of slow down, and then I see there's a pride of lions walking down the middle of the street. They were much further away when I, when I stopped, and they just kept coming and walking, walking. And about the time they got about this close to us, I look over and I notice that my son is breaking one of the two rules of Kruger National Park. Unlike Yellowstone, they have two rules. Number one, you never get out of your car. And number two, you always have your windows up. I look over, my son's window is down. And so I, I whisper to I don't yell, because I don't want to get these lions excited at this point, right? So I just kind of, I just kind of whisper, Christian, close your window, close your window. He's a 17-year-old boy, what does he do? Nothing, <laughs> nothing. Christian, close your window. Then they're getting really close. And they're about, and, and actually the two on the right were right by my side, and the two on the left were right by his side. And all I could think about, right as they got there, was I just had to whisper to Christian, Christian, don't pet the lion. <laughs> and I was grateful he didn't. About two years ago, I read in the newspaper some tourists in, in Kruger National Park were killed because some lions jumped in their window because they didn't have their window up. I sent that to him. He said, they didn't bother me. <laughs> OK, so we're not likely to face lions. There are a few cougars and mountain lions. but. We don't have those kinds of lions here in, in, in uh, the United States, but we do have bears. So I have a question for you. What should you do if you are attacked by a bear? What should you do? Everybody's kind of like, <laughs> Yesterday I was in Tulsa and the first woman said, run. I said, yeah, that's generally what we would do, but that's the worst thing you can do. Don't run from a bear. Okay, and then I had some other people said, well, you should play dead. Play dead. Someone said, don't move, play dead. And then I had somebody else say, no, 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 you should get big and scare the bear. I said, well, who's right? Get big, scare the bear, or play dead? Got just a little too excited there. Okay, well, let's try it out here. How many say, play dead? How many say, get big, scare the bear? Well, this is interesting, isn't it? So why do we disagree? We don't know. The reason we disagree, and I will tell you, you're both right and wrong. And the reason is because there are two types of bears. Oops, I hit the wrong. We have two types of bears in North America. We have brown bears and black bears. And your response to those should depend on which kind of bear it is. Okay, so it's a black bear, you should actually get big. You can scare a black bear away. They'll be like a raccoon. So you have big, you can yell at it, and, and they're likely to run away. Now, you don't want to do that to a grizzly. You do not want to do that to it. They will, they'll show you who's boss. So if it's a grizzly, if it's a brown bear, you actually want to play dead. So the important thing is you have to understand what kind of danger you're faced with. Once you can identify the danger, now you can appropriately deal with the danger. So how do you recognize? Well, black bears are darker, they're smaller. Brown bears, they have a hump on their back. They tend to be larger, squattier face. So you've got to understand what the danger is. And that's what our field guide is. So we're going to talk about some of the dangers you're going to face in the organizational world. Um, our book has some Ethics 101, but then the, the major part of the book is the 13 dilemmas. We have identified there are 13 fundamental ethical dilemmas in business, and here they are, or I should say organizational life. Number one, standing up to power, most common. Number two, you make a promise, then the world changes. What does that mean for your promise? Number three. Sometimes you have to intervene. When do you intervene? When's it appropriate? When not? Right? 
Conflicts of interest. I just want to say the following about conflicts of interest. One of the most common, but one of the least understood ethical dilemmas. When we talk about ethics skills, I find that that's the one that people struggle with the most. Conflicts of interest. They just don't recognize they have conflicts of interest. And the reason I believe that is because conflicts of interest sound bad. If somebody tells you you have a conflict of interest, no, I don't. Uh uh, I'm not. It's like you got chicken pox or something. No, I don't have a conflict of interest. The message I want to leave you with today is the only people in the world who have no conflicts of interest are people who have no interests. <laughs> if you have no family, if you have no friends, if you're not involved in anything, you have no conflicts of interest. So what I'm here to tell you, you're going to have conflicts of interest. Look for them. Embrace them. I tell my students, go out in the world and look for them. The first time you find you got a conflict of interest, pat yourself on the back. You're now important enough to have a conflict of interest. So look for them because the important thing about conflict of interest is not whether or not you have them. In fact, the more important you are, the more likely you are to have conflicts of interest. The important thing is managing them well. And if you deny that you have them, you're not going to look for them. So make sure you look for them, find them, then you can manage them well. Next, uh, sometimes we uh, suspect things. We don't have enough evidence. How do we deal with that? Uh, plain dirty. I don't even want to talk about that. But every now and again, we actually have to do something we didn't want to. Um, Sometimes we suspect with enough evidence. Sometimes we skirt the rules. We, organizations have all these rules, but we can't get their good stuff done without skirting the rules. When is that appropriate? When is it not? Um, dissemblance, that's a new world I'm going to treat you, uh, teach you today. Very few people know the word dissemble. Dissemble means to deceive, means to look different, make something look different, just slightly different than it actually is. We do that in organizations all the time. It's not lying, but it's deception. Is that ever appropriate? Well, sometimes, but not usually. How much loyalty should we provide to others? That's a tough one. We should be loyal. Boy Scout, Scouts Trust really loyal. But too much loyalty can actually turn into abuse. Um, sacrificing personal values, we all have personal values, but we live in a world where our values are different. Some people say, uh, based on religious reasons, I shouldn't work on Friday, some on Saturday, some on Sunday. How do you live in a world where we have different beliefs? How do you get true to your own beliefs, but also live in a world where you have to work with others? Um, sometimes we have an unfair advantage, or somebody else has an unfair advantage. How do you deal with that? Something goes wrong. Either you did something wrong, or somebody who works for you did something wrong. How do you address that appropriately? How do you make, how do you make it better? How do you repair? And then finally, when someone does something wrong, should you provide mercy? And if so, how much? When do you need to fire somebody? When do you need to say, no, just don't do it again that way? Okay. Bill talked about um, example, one of those at, at, at lunch um, earlier on that. So with that, that's my part. Please join me in welcoming my good friend, Bill O'Rourke. Hi, it's a privilege to be here. I'd like to join Brad in congratulating you for what you've been able to put together from the ethics standpoint. This is wonderful. Keep up the good work. When I come to a group like this, I like to say at least one thing that's worthwhile. So here it is. Don't text and drive. <laughs> if that's all you get out of today, uh, this will be worthwhile. I don't know if you've been on the road lately, but there's a lot of people swerving and that distracted driving is terrible. It raises the chance of an incident by about 400%. And it not only puts your own life in danger, it puts other people's lives in danger. So please, don't text and drive. This is my biography. Yeah, it shows uh, where I went to school, where I live, uh, where I've worked in my life. It shows my work uh, coat of arms that's up there from Ireland. Uh, I actually worked in Russia for uh, uh, 21 years, from 2005 to 2008. That's only three years, but they're like dog years, so you get seven years credit for each one of those. <laughs> Uh, I was fortunate to have a career at Alcoa where I started in 1975 as a patent attorney. Uh, and then every three years of my career I was given a job that I didn't expect to get. And I've run their procurement organization, I founded and ran Global Business Services. I was the CIO of the company. I knew Control-Alt-Delete and they put me in charge of IT. Uh, I was the corporate auditor uh, and I was the vice president of environment, health and safety three times under three different CEOs at Alcoa, which is wonderful because at Alcoa, environment, health, and safety is a value, a value that's with everybody all the time. So everybody, and at one time we had 144,000 employees, everybody thought they were responsible for safety, and it was a great place to work. 
but I've had a wonderful career, and during that career, I've been fortunate to have some ethical dilemmas that I got to wrestle with. And some of those are uh, put together, and behind every chapter, there's a section called Bill's Experiences, and they're in that book. I'm going to work through a, a couple of the examples that they have in the book and talk about them. Standing up to power, that's whenever someone in a position of power authority orders you to do something wrong. What do you do? Uh, when I was at Alcoa for a number of years, uh, the CEO came to me and said he was hiring a new CIO and asked me, would you agree to work for Patricia? And I, uh, he said, would you report to her? Uh, she's new to the company and she has to learn about the company and if you reported to her, you could help her out to get to know the company and the culture a lot quicker. So I said, I'd be glad to do that. So Patricia and I are walking down Madison Avenue in New York one day. She points to a purse in a window and said, Bill, go in and buy that purse for me, put it on your expense account, and I'll approve it. What do you do? That's wrong. It's clearly wrong. So of course I told her that. No, I'm not buying that purse for you. You make enough money. You buy the purse for yourself. But I had been with the company for a while. I had been there, I was pretty mature and self-confident in what I was doing and I could tell her that. Imagine if you just got out of school and you just got married and you have a mortgage and you want this job and your boss tells you to do something like that. What do you do? It's hard. You don't have time to call a meeting or even pull out the field guide and read what, what questions should I ask at this point in time. Uh, it's hard uh, to face up to that, but you have to do it in your life. You have to recognize when something's wrong and, and take a, take a hard position. I like to give a tip, one way to get around that. The first time your boss asks you to do something wrong, you say, ah, that's a test. I'm not falling for it. Nice try. Yeah, I hope I pass the test and get out of there. <laughs> if, it, if it's a bad boss, though, they're going to ask you again. And they're going to ask you to do something wrong. So be prepared for that. Intervention. When, when, do, we, when do we intercede? When we see something wrong, is it our place to jump in? You're all going to be made leaders, whether it's a leader of a work group or a department or a function or a business or a corporation. If you're the leader, you don't have the right to intervene. You have the obligation to intervene. You're the person that establishes, builds, and creates the culture within your work group or company or corporation. And if you see something wrong, you have to say something about it. Bad language, inappropriate jokes. Uh, wrong signs hanging up in the, in the warehouse. You have to stand up and say, this is inappropriate. That's not the kind of culture we want in our group. And you have to do something about it. So don't be afraid to intervene. Take that as, as a, a, a way to help reinforce the kind of culture that you're, you're building in your organization. We had a situation once in our plant in North Carolina. An employee, it was a plant in Baden, North Carolina, had 600 employees about 37% black employees. Uh, a white employee drove his pickup truck on the, on the property one day with a Confederate flag hanging off the back of it. Six foot by eight foot Confederate flag. He drives it onto the property. The HR manager met the plant manager as he drove in that morning and told him about the issue. The black employees don't like the Confederate flag flying here. And you have to do something about it. He was my friend. He called me and said, what do I do? He was from England. He wasn't even from the United States. He didn't appreciate the Confederate flag or Confederacy or the Civil War. He asked me if I could explain it to him. I said, I can't explain it to you. I came from Pittsburgh. I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. The most I knew about the Confederate flag was a TV show. But I could get my friend, my good friend Harold Shields, who was black, born, born and raised in Mississippi. We called Harold Shields in and we all got on a conference call. Harold told us about the Confederacy about the white supremacist group who use it as a symbol. Uh, by the time he was done, and, and he let people know that this is a sign uh, to remind you of slavery, etc. by the time he was done, you almost have tears in your eyes. So this plant manager, who had a pretty good instinct for right and wrong, he took the position that you cannot fly that Confederate flag on our property. The employee said, I got freedom of speech. He said, you can have freedom of speech, but not on our property. If you want to fly that flag, you park your truck down the street. And down the street was about a half a mile. So it was a little bit of a pain for him to walk to work, which he did for about two weeks. And then he took the flag down. Uh, but you think about some of these issues. When they arise, uh, the options that we listed, number one, do nothing. This will blow over. That's not a good option. In an ethical issue, that's rarely the good option. Don't do that. Face it and decide what the right decision is and then do it. Uh, there were a lot of arguments made during this one. At the time, the South Carolina Capitol building was actually flying the Confederate flag on the top of it. In the state of North Carolina, you could buy a vanity license plate that has numbers, Confederate flag numbers. 
How about that? Pretty interesting. But you have to ha make your own decision regardless of what other people are doing and do it on the basis of right and wrong. Plant manager took the position. And you th think about the one decision, do nothing. Good thing he didn't do that. The next day, the very next day, front page of the Wall Street Journal, center column, talked about the Confederate flag issue at a small plant that Alcoa had in North Carolina. And the plant manager came across as having done the right thing at the time. You're going to get these issues. They're going to seem to be interesting. But when you have a system of intervention, especially if you're the leader, intervene and do what's right. Another issue is conflict of interest. And as, uh, as Brad mentioned to you, everybody's going to have conflicts. The issue is how do you deal with them whenever you have them? Uh, one is uh, the most common one is giving and receiving gifts in a, in a business situation. Uh, everybody gets offered gifts by other people. I, I ran our procurement organization for a while. We had to buy about $18 billion. So you can imagine I was offered an awful lot of gifts. I tried to find uh, uh, what's right and wrong in this area. And the advice I give is first look at your corporate policy. The corporate policy typically says you cannot give or receive a gift that's more than nominal value. Well, what's nominal value? Yeah, two tickets to a Pittsburgh Steeler game with a parking pass. That's pretty high these days. Yeah, I'm not so sure that that's of nominal value. Uh, I was offered a lot of gifts in my position of vice president of procurement. I tried to find the biggest one I was offered. It was uh, a trip to a heavyweight championship boxing match in Manila, stopping in California on the way to go golfing for two days, stopping in Hawaii on the way back to go golfing for two days. Nominal. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed that people actually did business that way, or they tried to. Uh, but you're going to have these situations. When I ran the procurement department, uh, we had a fellow that bought uh, $200 million worth of electrical components. At the end of all his negotiation with all of his suppliers, he signs the contract. And the supplier that was awarded the contract, the biggest contract, sends him a gift. Can he keep the gift? Does it depend what it is? What if it's a pen, a big pen? Used, no cap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't do business with them again. Okay. Or, or a platinum pen and pencil set with your name already engraved on it. Well, my name's on it. No one else can use it. I may as well keep it. Uh, what, what's that rationalization, by the way? In all the ethical issues, when you start to rationalize, it's a leading indicator that you have a problem. Watch for rationalization. Oh, everybody does it. That's rationalization. Stop and pause when you hear yourself doing it. Oh, they're a big company. They can afford it. Watch it when you hear rationalization. It's a leading indicator of problems. Well, you have to look at your corporate policy. You have to decide if something looks wrong or it is wrong, it's wrong. If it looks wrong to someone else, it's probably wrong. So watch the messages that you send throughout the organization. Uh, I, I told the story of a, this morning of a corporate medical director that reported to me. Dan came back from his honeymoon. Smart man. And he said, uh, two doctors came to his wedding, Dr. Harvey and Dr. Checkaway, and they each gave him a check for $2,000 as a wedding present. Isn't that nice? Dr. Harvey and Dr. Checkaway were friends of his, but they were also consultants to Alcoa, two epidemiological consultants that made over $80,000 a year doing business with Alcoa. So I said to Dan, people might look at that as you just invited two suppliers to your wedding and they each gave you a kickback of $2,000. He said, no, not true. They gave it to me out of the goodness of their heart. We talked for an hour, and he agreed to return the gift. But he could have avoided that completely. On the invitation, he could have written, based on our business relationships, a gift will be inappropriate. I hope to see you at the wedding. You can usually avoid these by openness, honesty, and transparency up front at the very beginning. Suspicions without enough evidence. Often, that's the case. We think something's wrong, but we don't know, so we have to look into it. Uh, when I was in charge of safety for the corporation, uh, we got a call on our 800 compliance line that said the general manager of a plant of ours in Australia was instructing employees to spin the safety results. Well, what does that mean? We would get about 1,200 calls a year on our compliance line, uh, by the way, anonymous calls. We investigated 100% of them. Only 4% were substantive at all but we investigated all of them. This one fell in the safety area, so it was up to me to investigate. I got the best safety record keeper in the company from Tennessee, and I sent Donna Toosman to Australia. And I asked Donna to take a, take a look and see what you can find. She called me in a week and said she found 52 incidents that had not been reported. 
In each case, the victim and the safety manager said it was the plant manager who instructed them not to report. In Alcoa, safety was very important. And I think the safety manager wanted to look good despite the facts. So I took the report. The, that, that plant manager didn't report to me. So I took the report and gave it to his boss and his boss's boss. They called me to a meeting in New York and their question was, do we have to fire him? What do you think my answer was? Do we have to fire him? My answer was no. We don't have to fire him. He's already fired himself. <laughs> now, 100,000 employees are looking at you two to see what you do about it. See, we can make our bosses better bosses. We challenge them to do the right thing. And it's interesting, they weren't inclined to, to fire him. He was doing a good job in other respects. Uh, but they did, they took him out. And guess what? They reinforced the safety value in the company. To this day, if you ask in Alcoa, who are the leaders that reinforce the safety value, those two names will come up. And the reason is they took out a plant manager who was trying to spin the safety results. Interesting, and it would have worked the other way. Had they slapped him on the wrist, said don't do it again, the whole corporation would have said, you know, doesn't the safety value mean anything anymore? So when you get these dilemmas, don't, don't feel bad about them. They're an opportunity for you to reinforce what you really stand for. And, and that's a real opportunity for all of us, and you can do it. Skirting the rules, we all skirt the rules, right? We all, did you ever go over the speed limit? Oop, oop, maybe. Why, why do we assume that risk? It, it's, it's interesting. My, uh, my boss, when I went to Russia, wanted to have a staff meeting in Russia. He told all of his reports to get their visas and come to Russia. We're gonna have uh, the meeting in Bill's office. Uh, I got a call four days before the meeting from Ingrid in Europe and she said, I forgot to get my business visa. I don't have time to get it, but I can get a tourist visa. Would that be okay? I said, no, you're not a tourist. You're coming here for business. You know, attend the meeting by phone or come to the next meeting, but no, don't get a tourist visa. Well, the day of the meeting, four o'clock in the morning, the plane arrives from Frankfurt and, and Ingrid is on it. I get a call from the authorities at the airport. They say, is Ingrid here for business or is she a tourist? What would you say? Yeah, she's here for business. I said, she's here for business. They put her in jail, a Russian jail. Oh, <laughs> I convinced the authorities that they can put her in a hotel uh, with an armed guard, which I had to pay for, uh, and then ship her out of the country the next day. To this day, Ingrid doesn't like me. <laughs> yeah. but, but Ingrid respects me, and I think that's what we're after. We're after respect in this area. We have personal values. We all have personal values and we have to live by them. We have to decide. Uh, I, I remember a case when I was investigating a fatality in Mexico. Uh, a, an electrician at one of our plants in Mexico uh, electrocuted himself. He took a screwdriver and put it in a 220 outlet and he got electrocuted and he died. Uh, so that, that's the report, cause of death electrocution. So I went to investigate and I found out there's an awful lot more to the story, which you'll find out in almost every ethical situation or every investigation you have. There's at least two and sometimes five sides to a story. So I wanted to find out what was going on. Well, this man who was electrocuted had worked uh, on this same kind of job at least a thousand times. He knew exactly what he was doing. But he had also worked for the last three weeks, 60 hours a week. He was working seven days a week and he asked his boss if he could have this day off. It was a Sunday and his child was getting christened and he asked for the day off and his boss said, no, you must come to work. He electrocuted himself around 2 p.m. on a Sunday, which was right about the time his child was being christened. So what was the cause of death? Insensitive supervisor. And you're gonna get into these situations or someone in your organization is gonna get in a situation. They have to have an outlet to be able to ask someone else. You can't allow one insensitive supervisor to get in the way of doing what's right. People have personal values and they have to live by them. I like the story of the, uh, uh, the Mormon bishop who pitched for the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1960 when they won the World Series. His name was Vernon Law. Vernon made it clear when he joined the Pittsburgh Pirates, I don't pitch on Sunday. How about that in the major leagues? I don't pitch on Sunday. He won three games in the 1960 World Series without pitching on Sunday. How about that? And he stuck to his values. When you have these personal values, stick to them. You first have to decide what they are. Think about that. Unfair advantage, we all have unfair advantage sometimes, <laughs> especially if you work for a big corporation. 
So I work for Alcoa. I'm sitting in the airport in St. Louis. And you've all sat in the airport where you have a row of chairs and then there's a row directly behind it and these people are directly behind you. So I'm sitting there and there's four individuals behind me from Anheuser-Busch Company in St. Louis openly discussing the upcoming negotiation with Alcoa. <laughs> How about that? They're headed to Pittsburgh, where I'm headed to, and they're going to negotiate the biggest contract that Alcoa has every year, which is the can sheet contract with Anheuser-Busch. And they're talking about it openly. What do you do? Is it illegal to listen in? No. They're in a public place. Are they idiots? Yes. <laughs> but that's not my issue. My issue is now, what do we do about this? So I, I probably have two extremes. One is, get up, walk away, avoid the situation. The other is, listen, take notes. I decided they're both wrong, and I, I had work spread out, and I didn't want to leave anyway. Uh, I turned around, I introduced myself. I'm Bill O'Rourke, I'm with Alcoa, and shook hands with all four of them. I sat down, they kept talking. Can I listen now? Have I fulfilled my ethical obligation? It's interesting, I tell that story to some students. And there's usually one or two in the room that say, I still have not fulfilled my ethical obligation. This is too unfair, you have to walk away. Which kind of says, ethics are kind of personal. You have to decide what your ethics are yourself. Because you're the person that goes to bed at night, puts your head on a pillow, and you have to go to sleep. You're the person that wakes up in the morning, has to look yourself in the mirror and feel good about that experience. It can't be a burden. I thought I had fulfilled my ethical obligation. So I listened in. I took notes. I called my friend who was going to head that negotiating team, Bill Freeman, and I told Bill what I found. His first question to me was, did you tell them who you were? Doesn't that say a lot about Alcoa? It talks about the company. You're going to run into these situations in your life. You're going to have a negotiation with another party, and they're going to leave their folder with their notes in it in your conference room table. Can you look inside? Come on, it almost opened itself. <laughs> 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 what if they summarize the negotiation and instead of sending that summary email to their boss, they send it to you by mistake? Can you read it? When do you stop reading it? These are your ethical dilemmas. You're going to have them. You have a situation where someone takes copious notes during negotiation at the end, they fold them up and put them in your wastebasket. Come on, they've discarded them. Can't you pull them out and read them? <laughs> Remember, you have to decide what your ethical obligations are and then live by it. That's your job. Repair. When you find that something is wrong, you must fix it. You have to fix it fast, you have to fix it fairly, and you have to fix it in full. An example I'll give you is, on the last day of the month, when you really want to ship product, uh, if you work for a corporation, I had the, uh, head of, the superintendent of the, uh, of the mill came to my office and he said, we shipped that big product of extrusions. He said, we got it out before the end of the day. I said, well, how in the world did you do that? The inspection equipment doesn't work, and the specs for that big order require inspection of the product. He said, well, we've been inspecting that product for three years. We've never found a defect, so we just shipped it. Well, that's wrong. That's just entirely wrong. So you have to fix it. How do you fix that? Well, we called the customer and told him exactly what happened. By the way, if that was a, uh, an aerospace product, the FAA requires the inspection. It would have been against the law not to inspect, but it wasn't. It was window frames is what it was. And a defect could be corrected if it was really bad. So we told him what happened. We said the shipment's on his way. What, what the customer said was, we haven't had a defect in three years while we've been inspecting it. We'll take the product and we'll put it out. If, if a defect shows up later, will you take care of it? We said yes, uh, which was good. But you have to repair these things and repair them fast and quickly. But try to avoid repair by doing the right thing in the first place. Had we called the customer ahead of time, he probably would have said ship it and it would have been no problem. You're going to have other situations in your life where you can repair, even when you didn't do the damage. Let me give you a simple story. I'm at a pit basketball game, and uh, I'm buying a Pepsi. I'm in line. There's two 12-year-old uh, boys in front of me, each buying a Pepsi. They bought it, they, and then I went up to the line and bought mine. I turn around, and evidently one of them dropped theirs. It's on the ground. And they're arguing over whose fault it was, what happened to the Pepsi, and I've got a solution in my hand. I handed the Pepsi to the boy that didn't have it, repaired that situation, and for a few bucks got myself another Pepsi. I didn't cause that problem. 
Yet I was in a position to repair it. Should we do that? Is that the kind of world we want? When we're in a position to do more than is re required of us, isn't that what we should be doing? Think about that. And I, I was taught by one of the best. Paul O'Neill was one of the best uh, CEOs of any corporation could ever have. We were building a wastewater treatment plant in Mexico uh, because ours had, had died out. And he, he's reviewing the whole product and realizes that the city didn't have a wastewater treatment plant in Mexico. And he said, how much more would it cost for us to be able to treat the water for the whole city, not just for our plant? And it was about 15% more. He said, let's do that. He said, that's the right thing to do. How about that? Now you're talking real money. But if you're in a position and you have the money, don't we do more than is what, what is required? Isn't that the kind of ethical environment and ethical culture that you want to build in your organization? Now, we aren't philanthropists, of course, and we can't go out and just doing good all the time everywhere, but when we're in a position to repair something and we have the ability to do it, maybe we ought to do that. Uh, I was speaking at Carnegie Mellon University and I had the students ask me, who are your heroes of life? And I said, where'd that question come from? They said, our, our teachers always ask us that, to list 10 heroes of your life. I said, well, let me show you a picture. And I showed them this. This is a den at my home. And if you look closely, in the upper left-hand corner is a picture of Paul O'Neill. He's one of my heroes. I've had these same 10 heroes in my life for about 20 years. And about five years ago, I decided I'm going to get pictures of them all and put them in frames. Uh, the other hero that's alive is uh, Bill McDonough. He's over on the right side. He's a sustainability guru. This guy thinks so far beyond other people uh, that I just uh, admire this person and he tries to do what's right. He's currently working with the premier of China to be able to design, he's an architect, to design a home for the billion poor people of the world. Wouldn't that be a project to work on? So we talk about every six weeks and he tells me, he said, I get this project, I'm working on it. The next time we talk, he said, remember that project I'm working on? He said, I set a goal for myself. I want the home to cost zero or less. Six weeks later, we talked. He said, you know my goal for the home to cost zero or less? He said, I got it. I'm going to send the people to the dump. They're going to pick up old uh, PET bottles and aluminum cans, and we'll make extrusions and panels out of that, and they'll be able to take them home, pop them together, and they'll have an insulated home, twice the size of the home they have now, that actually collects water, by the way, and runs it through a filter uh, that'll filter the water and make it clean. But to get people to think like that and think beyond what's, what's uh, normal in the world, uh, that's why I admire uh, Bill McDonough. Others up there, I have astronauts. I have two of them. Yuri Gagarin, first man in space, and Neil Armstrong. Uh, I was at a dinner one night and I was talking about how I really admire the astronauts. And I didn't know the man sitting next to me was a close personal friend of Neil Armstrong. Three days later, I get this big envelope from Ohio and it's from Neil Armstrong. And inside were two pictures of Neil, one with him holding his ha helmet and one of him walking on the moon. And it says to Bill O'Rourke, best wishes from Apollo 11, signed sincerely, Neil Armstrong. But the cover letter was interesting. This is from Neil Armstrong and he writes, Dear Bill, our mutual friend Carl Norick asked me to send these to you. If this is an imposition on your good nature, I apologize. Sincerely, Neil Armstrong. An imposition <laughs> on my good nature? And that's humility. And, and it comes with some of the people, and I admire him for the humility that he has. Uh, others that I have up there are Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Pope John Paul II, Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was the President of the United States. He wrote a lot of the documents, and uh, founding documents of our country. And on his tombstone, do you know what's written there? Thomas Jefferson, architect. That's what he was proud of. Architect, more humility. And you find that in uh, some admirable leaders around the world. I suggest that you think about that. Who do you admire and why? Uh, the, the final one I have up there is my father. If you read the book, you'll hear some stories in there about my father. He taught me a lot, an awful lot. Some concluding comments. I urge you to seek true north. True north is the ultimate. It's uh, it's whenever you think as far as you can, and then you think further. So I used to challenge the different functions that I have to think as far as you can. In safety, what's, what's true north in safety? Zero incidents? No, think further than that. You could send your employees home healthier than they were when they came to work. And you can do that. We feed some of our employees at some of our plants. Feed them good food. Have cancer screening, smoke cessation programs, weight reduction, exercise programs. You can do that. So you gotta think far. I used to challenge the procurement people. What's the least that you could pay for goods or services? And they'd say zero and I'd say no. 
you could get suppliers that pay you for the privilege of doing business with your company. Okay, that's ridiculous. But the theory is not ridiculous. <laughs> the next time you set a goal or objective for yourself, ask yourself, have I thought far enough? And then think further. Be honest, listen, be compassionate, have humility, build trust. Build trust. What does trust give you? Trust gives you speed. If we had a small organization and everybody trusted each other and somebody does something crazy, as happens every day in every organization, we don't sit around and wonder what did they do, what were their ulterior motives, what's their hidden agenda. We just keep doing our best to figure, well, I'll find out about that later. If you trust each other, you don't waste time with the gossip and the back talk and other things like that. You just get your work done. And you'll find if you build trust, you will build speed. I had an example. I worked in a, a warehouse operation. I had 17 warehouses. And when I was first given this job, I went to the biggest warehouse and I met with the union workers, just over 100 union workers. And I told them about me, about our objectives and what we were trying to do in customer service. At the end, the smart aleck union member, of course, stood up when I said, are there any questions? And the smart aleck says, how much money do you make? What would you say? I could have given an obfuscating answer, such as we use the Hay evaluation system, we base our payment and compensation on problem solving, know-how and accountability. We gauge ourselves against other corporations and pay each other accordingly. <laughs> that couldn't answer his question though. I thought for about three seconds and I decided I'm gonna tell him. And I told him to the penny how much I made, what my annual salary was, and I knew that number was higher than anyone in the room. You know what I got with that answer? Trust. I had that smart aleck call me over every time I visited that, that uh, warehouse. He would show me a forklift truck that needed repaired and it wasn't getting attention. He would show me the Timken roller bearing bin is too low. We need more of that product. And he would clue me in on things that were going on. Sometimes being honest pays an awful lot of dividends and builds that trust that we really need. Practice excellent habits. There's a book out now called uh, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. In the book he says build good habits. Habits are hard to break. If you have a bad habit, that's hard to break. If you have a good habit, that's hard to break. So why don't we build good ones instead of bad ones? In that uh, book there's a chapter called The Ballad of Paul O'Neill and it talks about Paul's habitual excellence in safety in Alcoa, which he had. Uh, it's, it's an excellent book, but I, I encourage you to build and practice excellent habits. Bless the lives of those you touch. Seek advice of others, but remember you own the decision. I, I had a situation once where we found trichloroethylene in the groundwater in a plant in uh, El Campo, Texas, in, and uh, uh, the environmental manager called me at 5 o'clock p.m. on a Wednesday and said we just found trichloroethylene in the groundwater, what do we do? Uh, so I did an investigation immediately and found out that we did own this plant. We had a consent decree from the state of Texas that required us to drill core samples and report the results in 90 days. I asked the remediation people, can you fix it? They said no. We could work 18 years and we can't fix the aquifer and get the trichloroethylene out. We could filter it, but we can't get it out. I asked the lawyer, what do we do? He said, don't do anything. He said, if you do anything, you'll admit liability. Do what the law says, report the results in 90 days. I asked the health people, is trichloroethylene bad? They said, it's a known carcinogen. If you ingest it, you'll get cancer. Are we ingesting it? Yes. 125 families in the city of El Campo, Texas, all drinking well water from the same aquifer, this aquifer that has trichloroethylene in it. What do you do? Do you, do you report the results in 90 days? No. Put yourself in their position. Imagine if that was your family living in that city. The next morning, Alcoa called their, their uh, engineers together, knocked on the doors of 125 families in the city, told them what we found, told them that we will bring you water, uh, big jugs of water, and replenish that over the next two weeks while we put a filter on your well that'll filter out the trichloroethylene. That decision cost a million dollars. Do you do it anyway? Well, Alcoa had the ability to do it. Even if we weren't fiscally sound, you would have at least disclosed that issue way ahead of time, I think. Uh, but by doing that, that, that was a million dollar decision and we did it. A point I like to make is uh, when I got that problem, I didn't have to go to Paul O'Neill's office and say, Paul, this just happened in Texas, what do we do? He had made it so clear, you do what's right and I'll stand behind you. I went to him a couple days later, told him what we found and what we were doing about it. I hope you get to work for an organization where the leaders make it clear that I want you to do what's right and we'll stand behind you and support you in the process. Better yet, I hope you're that leader, the leader that makes it clear to your work group or your organization that I want you to do what's right and I'll stand behind you whenever that happens. 
treat everybody with dignity and respect. Oh, uh, on, the, on that point, on the trichloroethylene, the lawyer told me don't do anything. I took that advice, I listened to it, I rejected it, I'm sorry. We're gonna do what's right. And I don't blame the lawyer. He was looking just from a legal compliance standpoint. That's okay. But remember, when you make the decision, you own it. Listen to the advisors, but you own that decision. Yeah, treat absolutely everybody with dignity and respect, regardless of position, age, race, number of degrees that they have, the color of the hat on their head. Doesn't matter. Treat everybody with dignity and respect. Tell right from wrong, that's easy. But being more right is hard. So when you find a, a position between right and wrong, they're usually the easy decisions, but whenever you're trying to find right for more right, you have to focus on that and get the most out of life. I like to consider life like a great big hourglass and every instant, like this instant, it's coming through. Grab that grain of sand with both hands, squeeze it, get everything out of the every instant so when you let it go, you have no regrets. And then when you're my age, hopefully when you look at the big pile, there's few regrets in that pile. A couple concluding uh, comments. I saw this on a church. It said, honk if you love Jesus, text while driving if you want to meet him. <laughs> but then, then I saw this sign. Th th this is a great one. Text and drive from a funeral home. <laughs> Terrible. Thank you.